This is World War III. So, it appears as though one of the largest cities in Ukraine is being liquidated of its human resources as we speak. A mass exodus from the city is underway. Now, this is based on the limited amount of information that we have coming out of Ukraine because it's very tightly controlled, as all democracies are nowadays. Of course, it's illegal to upload video, but the one video that I've caught wind of that appears to be legit that is circulating around right now is showing jam-packed, ass-to-ass, gridlock corridors outside the city, people trying to get the hell out of Dodge while they still can. It's so bad, in fact, that you have people driving on the wrong side of the road in the inbound to the city traffic lanes trying to get out right now. People are not succumbing to the normalcy bias that's seen a lot of people trapped at the beginning of this war because they listened to the Ukrainian government who said, don't worry, there's not a war coming. This, of course, because they didn't want to impede military maneuverability and logistics routes. And of course, they needed to trap manpower there to throw as cannon fodder into the front lines. And that's just a hard reality that everybody is coming to terms now. It's now well within the Overton window to say that out loud. Now, as we speak, since Russia unofficially declared a war by first referring it to to it as a war, Dmitry Peskov, the press secretary for Vladimir Putin, on the same day of the Crocus terrorist attacks in Moscow, for the first time framed this as a war. And since that time, Russia has been heavily targeting Ukraine's critical infrastructure, in particular their power grids and their telecommunications networks. Now most of Ukraine is dependent on Starlink for internet, and a lot of the country is blacked out, including Kharkov. Now it appears as though what the Russians are trying to do is shape a situation where they can encircle Kharkov, possibly do a full-scale invasion, but that's going to be big because, of course, this city when in its peacetime uh, population is around 1.2 million people, I believe. Very big city, 15 to 20 times bigger in population than was the city of Bakhmut. I'm not sure how dug in it is. I don't know how many Cold War era bunkers, how many Azovstal type steel plants and tunnel networks there is to hide under there, but that could be one hell of a protracted, bloody, battle if it actually takes place. I'm sure that the Russians are going to try to take it through some other means so they don't have to go block by block because if they do, that is going to be a nasty one. Now, the Ukrainian government, unfortunately, has a vested interest in keeping as many people there as possible. I don't know if this was a government decree evacuation order. Again, uh, information is limited. I'm guessing people are leaving the city of their own volition. They don't want us to come to that normalcy bias that had them trapped there in Kiev where, you know, everybody who wasn't uh, militant, had a gun put in their hand so that they could be the poster child of a Time magazine article uh, to win international sympathy and, you know, how the whole thing went. Unless Ukraine at this point in time gets some windfall of financial support from the West, then it's over. And I think this guy right here, Zelensky, knows that. And when I say it's over, all I mean is that they're going to hand the keys to NATO. Okay, so that doesn't mean the war is over. In fact, that means the war is just getting started. What you're seeing right now, very covertly, is Zelensky is turning over his entire cabinet. Every single day, I read about another five to ten people that he is relieving of their positions and putting new people in the government. Almost as if to give them like paid extended vacations, sabbaticals, uh, other jobs in diplomatic positions around the world or in adjacent countries. Almost as if they're starting to build a government in exile. They're getting ready to hand NATO the keys. Maybe they think in their mind that this new skeleton crew that they're throwing in there is going to have better bargaining potential and that they're going to be able to hoodwink the Russians with Minsk 3.0 or, or whatever it is they cook up next. Uh, but it starts to look like this could be what's happening. They're going to hand NATO the keys because right when the F-16s enter the battle zone and it's going to be American pilots, I'm going to talk about this in a moment. I talked about it the other day and <laughs> I waited 48 hours and it was confirmed. Anyways, once those enter 
the fray, the NATO and the Ukrainian military will be virtually indistinguishable at that point. And of course, this means that NATO is effectively at war with Russia directly. And what we once knew as the Ukrainian government will just dissolve and merge to be this transmutated version of NATO, Ukraine, Ukraine NATO, Ukraine NATO, maybe that's what they'll call it. I don't know what they're going to call it, but it's going to be this new entity that emerges where it's kind of governed loosely from abroad, maybe somewhat on the front line from a distance, because of course, these guys who've been in there capitalizing on all the pain and suffering of the Ukrainian people for so long are going to jump ship as soon as as well, not as soon, but you know, they're going to try to ride it out to the bitter end. But Zelensky wants to give everybody a running head start. And then he, of course, is going to take that business trip at the very last minute and likely not return. Now, that is not even the biggest story of the day. The biggest story of the day is Israel effectively declaring war on Iran. Today, Israel took out three brigadier generals of the IRGC on Iranian soil inside Syria, okay? So we're talking about the Iranian embassy, the consulate next to it, which was hit, completely destroyed, right between the Canadian embassy and the Iranian embassy, in fact. Three high-ranking brigadier generals were assassinated, as well as, I think, four or five more higher officials. And this, of course, was a full-blown declaration of war. Israel is getting ready for war. Just 24 hours prior to this attack, gold was on a bull run. Gold has been on a tear, touching almost $2,300. Completely insane. Day after day. In the week prior to what we are seeing now, gold went up nearly like, what is it, like 100 bucks, 150 bucks. This is unprecedented in the history of gold. A move like that you see that in Bitcoin. You don't see that in gold. Why? Because gold is like 15 times a bigger market. For those types of numbers to move, when the US dollar hasn't moved, and I know I was one of the people who coined the term that you know gold, the price of gold doesn't change, the US dollar it measured in does, but not in this case. Okay, this is different. So this means that something else is happening, which means that it's trying to tell us something. Gold and oil are the barometer for shit hits the fan, and they're both slowly creeping upwards. Here's what's going on in Israel right now. Israel is currently amassing emergency supply of fuel, food, medical gear to prep for war versus Hezbollah, over $500 million, half a b -b 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 billion invested in boosting stockpiles of these basic provisions. Now that's just boosting stockpiles okay that's not their actual wartime strategic stockpile that's boosting stockpiles we've been talking about these exercises they've been running the evacuation orders issued in the north we've been talking about the parking lots that are being loaded up getting prepared for war it's about to go down the people in israel are beating on benjamin netanyahu's doorstep day after day the protests get more violent and bigger so if he doesn't start this war soon He's on his way out, and I don't know if he's going to get out unscathed if he does get out of office. So long as he can retain power, then he might have some sort of immunity. But uh, as soon as they get rid of him, then his days are probably numbered. And he knows that, which is why they're going to try to bring the United States into this conflict. That's exactly what's going to happen. Right around the time that that American humanitarian vessel enters the conflict zone, which is going to be in and of itself a tripwire so that you're putting American troops in, uh, in the pathway of the conflict and possibly they are going to suffer casualties and that, of course, will be justification for America entering the war directly, of course. They don't have to say anything, but they've been on the ground the whole time helping the Israelis. They're very indistinguishable. I mean, you know, in a lot of cases, you're speaking the same language. Uh, the demographic of the people in uniform... <laughs> Are, are very similar, so it's very difficult to tell, right? So anyways, in parallel, electricity grid fortified to minimize rocket damage. Daily blackouts are expected when the war with Hezbollah begins. Israel is going to be halting gas rig operations. They're going to be switching to alternative sources of energy. 
during the war. So they, they got this penciled in. This is all planned. Hezbollah is expected to fire up to 5,000 missiles and rockets daily. Now, of course, these are going to be far more powerful, far more accurate rockets that can defeat the already diminished Iron Dome system of the Israelis. So the Israelis are in for a fight. Now, what I worry is that someone in Hezbollah, because they have the capacity to do this, anyone in the IRGC, Yemen, Iran, they could target the Israeli Dimona nuclear facility. And if they do that, we've seen how disproportionately the Israelis overreact to anything, right? So what's likely going to happen is that that Samson option, I think the nuclear threshold, I mean, this is a people who had something called the Hannibal Doctrine. Okay, let's just think about that for a sec. The Hannibal Doctrine goes basically like this. Uh, if you're in a war zone and there's friendlies and you're trying to kill the bad guys and if the Hannibal Doctrine is enacted at that time, you just blast everybody. Okay, it uh, reminds me of a scene in Braveheart where the king, uh, you know, that <clears throat> basically commissions the guy to... Uh, tell the archers to fire and he says Saya won't they fire on our guys too and he's like yeah but they'll hit they'll hit the other guy too so just do it right so they don't care about friendly fire at that point in time the Hannibal doctrine I do believe that with a threshold so low that the risk of utilizing the Samson option in this scenario is very high especially if there's any sign that Hezbollah is getting the upper hand and once you use, you use nuclear weapons against a unarmed nuclear superpower, does that then give license to Russia to use nuclear weapons in the war against Ukraine? Does the use of nuclear weapons in one theater increase the likelihood of nuclear weapons in another? Now, of course, the UN is going to be triggered and nothing's going to happen, as it typically does. The UN has proven to be completely and utterly useless. They are totally sterile in their ability to have any sort of, to effect any sort of change on the situation as it is. So I think that uh, what we're about to see is an explosion of conflict throughout the Mid Middle East, the likes of which we haven't seen probably ever. It's probably going to dwarf the Iraq war in terms of uh, how full-blown this conflict can go. Now recall I was just telling you guys about how the Iranians have been finalizing their nuclear power facility, how they're basically offline with the International Atomic Energy Agency, the nuclear watchdog, who claims, even though the Iranians claim otherwise, but they claim that Iran has somewhat gone rogue in terms of their nuclear enrichment activities, and they're releasing new videos on a daily basis of these massive nuclear-proof bunkers that they've been building out, they've been launching spy satellites. So they're getting ready for a massive war. They know it's coming, it's just a matter of time. So this is what Israel is doing. They say that officials say war will erupt unexpectedly regardless of who initiates it. Most rockets to target Haifa area and northern Israel. Okay, and remember we're talking about Hezbollah. They have a vast extensive network of underground bunker systems that dwarfs that of what Hamas has. And of course, Hamas has no resupply, with the exception of maybe the trucks that they're jacking. But Hamas is, this is, you know, Lebanon has pathways for resupply all throughout their, their massive border with uh, Syria and Iraq. So, you know, this is going to be a different kind of war, and this is why the United States, and you can expect there will be U.S. boots on the ground. So this is something, if you are in the U.S. military, you might want to pay attention to, because I do believe eventually you will be called up to, to duty in that region, whether you like it or not, to die for Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, on the topic of the F-16 pilots, I just said this a few days ago, and sure enough, now we have <clears throat> confirmation, excuse me. So in an interview with a Ukrainian news organization, an American pilot named Don or Dan Hampton 
basically said that he and a group of other military pilots are ready to fight in Ukraine flying F-16s when these aircraft are delivered there. Now, I told you guys that why would you waste a perfectly good plane on a noob when you have so many vets just itching for a chance? They've been waiting their whole lives. They've been watching Top Gun on repeat and the new uh, revised version on repeat ever since this war began, itching for a chance, just one chance to get in there and get shot down by Russian air defense. And that's what they're going to do. And so this is why right when everything appears to be collapsing, Zelensky is going to hand NATO the keys and they're just going to be like, you, you guys take it over. The F-16s are going to come in. That border between Poland and Ukraine is going to become indistinguishable. The authorities there are going to try to downplay when the Russian missiles start getting very scarily close to the Polish border. But eventually, the war is going to spill over. And you're already hearing rumblings that, don't worry, if our NATO troops are fighting the Russians inside Ukraine, it's not technically Article 5. You see what they're doing? You see how sneaky that is? So they can now fight the Russians to their heart's content. They can throw millions of guys into the meat grinder so long as it happens on the front, along the Dnieper River, along Kiev, along Belarusian border. As long as it's there and not on NATO territory, then don't worry. We don't have to worry about nuclear Armageddon. But here's the thing. If that is the scenario then Russia will use a nuke. Okay, many high-ranking Russian officials have already said it is now, they've made it inevitable. If NATO decides to confront Russia in the way that appears they're about to, when the Zelensky regime collapses, then it's going to inevitably lead to the use of a nuclear weapon in an attempt to try to get NATO to back off. Hampton first made such statements for the U.S. media and now confirmed his attentions on Ukrainian television. According to him, he has professional experience in the form of more than 150 combat missions operating American F-16 fighters. Now, apparently Scott Ritter on Twitter claims that this guy is all talk and the missions that he flew were all against, you know, defenseless countries that didn't have S-400 missile defense systems. And he may be right, but it's Scott Ritter. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. As is the case with the operation of the expensive NATO-made air defense systems, at first, it will not be Ukrainians, or at least not only Ukrainians, who can fly F-16 fighters in Ukraine. The point is that the first to find themselves in the cockpits of American-made fighters will be career or retired pilots from NATO countries. Okay? How many opportunities does a guy flying an F-16 going to have like that, really, to prove himself, to, to say, to live to tell the tale I took out a Russian plane, or I bombed a Russian position. I fought the Russians. That's what every American military pilot would love on their resume. And I'm not saying that they, you know, they, they want a war, but, you know, at the end of the day, if you train for something long enough, you know, eventually you want to hit something, right? You can only punch air for so long. Now, I could talk about this bird flu stuff. Um, bird flu continues to jump from species to species. Apparently somebody, only the second known case in American history has been discovered in Texas. So this is now, I believe it was at sea lions that it was infecting last year. And it was infecting so many different types of species. So it's, it's already jumping species which means that it's only a matter of time uh, when you, I, and I'm pretty sure there was, there was either species to species spread with sea lions, or it was just that the seagulls were pooping so much around where the sea lions hang out that that's why they were catching it. But you're gonna see uh, tra transmission, you know, outside of birds very soon. And then when that happens, it's only a matter of time before it jumps to humans. I believe this guy was exposed through a sick cow, possibly. And uh, so yeah, bird flu, maybe that's what's going to save the, the Biden administration, a new lockdown. And boy, when that lockdown comes, that one is going to be the real deal, man. That one, you're going to have a lot of people just voluntarily staying home. That's going to be the contagion narrative played out. 
Again, I talked briefly about the three brigadier generals killed in the Iranian strike. The Iranians are basically saying that they hold the Americans accountable as a result of that. Now, the Americans, as expected, are playing dumb. They're saying we had nothing to do with it. But uh, through the Swiss embassy in Iran, the Iranians have communicated with the Americans, indicating that they are, we think that you are culpable for this. And of course, you can't really deny that considering Israel basically gets a blank check. They get to act with impunity. You know, they're not even going to get their hands slapped for this. Uh, they killed five aid workers, foreign aid workers from a bunch of different European countries today. And nobody even batted an eye. They just barely said sorry. So they can do whatever they want. It's just uh, how the world is at this point in time. They are now approving a plan for Rafa. So they're about to invade Rafa. And they're also at the highest level of readiness on the northern Front. Home Front Command has been raised to the highest level in anticipation of the war with Hezbollah. IDF Chief on the General Staff LTG Herzi Halevi held a meeting in the Northern Command with the Commanding Officer of the Northern Command and members of the General Staff today in which he approved plans for the continuation of fighting and held a situational assessment. Last night, Peter Schiff made a very ominous tweet in light of what happened today with the uh, killing of three brigadier generals. Uh, he said, it's very rare for gold to be trading over $30 higher on a Sunday night. Rarer still is it to be doing so on no news. Well, you know, we know there's insider trading and they front run what's gonna happen. They know what's gonna happen, all right? There's some people, maybe in the Israeli government, make a few phone calls, make a few moves. The Israeli government claims they didn't tell the United States, but like, let's get real. Something big is happening, and he said this last night, something big is happening that very few investors are prepared for. More importantly, governments and central banks are not prepared for it either. Are we going to see a massive revaluation of gold? Go watch the video that we did with Rafi Farber around six months ago, where he talks about how the real value of gold is its ability to denominate all assets because at the crooks, at the foundation of the derivative-based economy, whether it's fiat, uh, bonds, and all the other financial instruments that are all derived, that all derive their value from gold. Gold is at the base of the pyramid, okay? And so everything, according to him, he thinks that we're going to see a revaluation of gold that could be, I don't know the exact number, but it could be like 10 to 100x. Now, again, that is not financial advice. I'm not saying run out and buy gold. You know, I don't even know. I think I've had a link in the description for an affiliate gold company, but, you know, I don't think we've ever really even made much money through that. And quite frankly, I don't care. I don't want people going and making a decision like that. I can feel comfortable knowing that people are going to invest in preps that they're going to use. But you invest in gold and precious metals as a means of preserving value. That's it. That's all. You don't invest in those things to get rich. Okay, that, that would be my only piece of financial advice that I have for people. Uh, Israel is also going to be banning Al Jazeera, which is another sign that they're getting ready to do crazy shit. Because Al Jazeera is one of those news agencies that even though they're pretty much in lockstep with the Western media because they kind of have to be to gain international recognition and be viewed as like an official mainstream media source, but they do tend to side a bit more with the Palestinian narrative and they're, they've now been given the boot. They're saying that they were complacent, complacent with the events of October 7th. And this is another sign that war is about to come because, of course, you want to control the narrative, you want to control the media, you want to control the information that is able to get out. Okay, I think I've covered most things here. Uh, the Estonian defense minister came out and admitted today that basically every NATO member country has military personnel in Ukraine. What a surprise. As military attaches or people who travel to Ukraine from time to time. I mean, that's old news, man. I almost get tired of stories like that because when you're this far ahead of the curve, as far as we are, you know, a lot of this stuff just is like boring to me because I see, you know, we're like at, in the very least, we're several months ahead of all this stuff. 
And that's only because we're knee deep in this information every single day. So when the story arises and everybody's freaking out like, oh, NATO's in Ukraine. It's like, yeah, really? <sighs> Dutch getting nuclear capable F-35s in exchange for their F-16s that they're going to send to Argentina. Looks like Argentina might open up another front soon as well as Ukraine and uh, the whole Havana syndrome thing. It almost seemed like this was conjured up at the last minute uh, to try to boost the Russophobia that, of course, was lacking. And uh, apparently the U U.S. government now walked it back and said, oh, yeah, we don't have any evidence that the Russians were doing this. But it somewhat vindicates a guest we had on recently, Arthur T. Bradley, a NASA engineer, who basically addressed the topic of Havana syndrome from a very empirical point of view, where he basically laid out what the symptoms were, what the possible explanations were, what the plausible explanations were. And uh, yeah, so if you want to you know, learn more about it, go and check out that video. I think he gives a very even-keeled analysis of that. And the Russians are already hunting for F-16s in Ukraine. I'm going to leave it there. Because, uh, yeah, you can see my crew behind me here. So I guess this guy is going to be leaving us soon. We're going to see uh, who do you think will be the last man standing. I know some of you guys think this guy will be the last man standing. Let's uh, take some bets. And as you can see, I don't have Justin Trudeau yet. The only reason why is because I don't want to have to look at the guy every single day when I come into the office. But we'll probably have to get one for good measure. Let me know who else I should add to the cast here. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. The best way to support this channel is to gear up at CanadianPreparedness.com. And some people are too oversensitive. I was yelling at people today. I released a video earlier in the day where I was trying to motivate people to get out there, use your gear. We're releasing a series of comprehensive firearms training videos. It's not enough to just be consuming an endless stream of bad news. You got to get out. Like me personally, I love it when people are yelling at me to motivate the hell out of me. Like if I had my own personal C.T. Fletcher or David Goggins, that would be freaking awesome to get me through today to maximize my productivity. So if I hurt your little tender snowflake feelings by yelling at you to get off your ass and do something, then I don't apologize because uh, it's going to be a lot worse when shit hits the fan. Thanks for watching. Canadian Brother out.